Good to be here this morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me. But when Don asked me to come here, I, I wasn't thinking about all the speaking that we've been doing lately, like last night, this morning, tonight. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, I wasn't even sure last night what I was going to talk about this morning. Then I'm talking to Don, and Don has a way of twisting your mind with all his astronomy stuff. And so, which is good for me because, you know, like I've been telling you all along, I've got a wild imagination. And when somebody brings this stuff up that's a little bit beyond, you know, just theory, it is theory, but I mean, it forces me to use my imagination. So anyways, while we're talking last night, ah, I know what I'm going to talk about, a subject that I really like, but I rarely ever talk about. I probably haven't talked about it for a few years, but a number of years ago, when I finished university, I came out and, and, uh, started teaching school. So my wife started teaching, she stuck with it. I taught for two years, seventh grade, and then one year in high school. Loved every bit of it, and would have stayed there, it's just that I was a little bit too restless to think about doing that for the next 40 years. So anyhow, uh, uh, while I was teaching science class one day, I was talking about the le electromagnetic wave spectrum. And I'm talking about how little we see, and I'll explain what this is all about, how little we see in terms of the whole spectrum. And so anyways, I was talking about um, colors. We only see from red to blue. And some smart aleck kid asked me a question. So I said, the highest frequency we can see is blue, into violet. So this kid puts his hand up and says, and I said, what? And he says, what color lies beyond blue? Well, it blew my mind, the question. And I thought, well, no, we can't see beyond that. But what color lies beyond blue? Well, that started me on a long, long pursuit. In fact, I got a half a book written on what is heaven like from a scientific standpoint. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Anyways, before we begin, let's start with prayer. Dear Father, we want to thank you for being the creative God you are. You created the whole universe. And according to Don, we've got three or two trillion galaxies. Say nothing about all the stars and the planets and everything within those galaxies. What an awesome God. You also gave us an understanding of science, which you, Father God, consider your second book. We know the Bible is your for first book, and, and science and nature is your second book. So we're going to be working out of both of those today. Jesus, we want to thank you for what you did on Calvary. It's, it's what you did that, that uh, allows us to even have any hope whatsoever, because you died for each one of us there on Calvary 2,000 years ago, and gave us the opportunity to have eternal life, to get to heaven, and to comprehend what it's going to be like. So we want to thank you for that. Satan, I know you're going to want to be here to try to distract and destroy, but I command you in the name of Jesus, by the power and the blood that he spilled on Calvary, you get lost, you don't belong here. This is a closed meeting between ourselves and our Father God, and now Holy Spirit, descend upon this place in that void in the name of Jesus. Amen. So anyways, I started studying. What color lies beyond blue? Pfft, I don't know. And so it didn't take me long, because the reason I was studying all this, because all of a sudden it hit me. We are limited. Our human bodies are limited in what we experience. Because here's the way it works with electro, like, electromagnetic waves. Now, this sounds like a big, heavy science topic that we're going to get all bogged down and we won't even understand what's going on. But whether you know it or not, you're being bombarded right now by millions of different waves. Some of them you hear, this loud mouth up here. You hear those. So some you're aware of, others... You have no idea. You don't know that AM waves or, or radio, you know, FM waves or uh, short waves, all of which are going in and through. Some are going through you like gamma rays and X-rays. They're going through you. You don't, even, you don't even know about it. So we hear certain parts of the electromagnetic. So Don, can I have you move to the next slide? We might as well get right into it. This is a very busy. I, I, I'm not very good at PowerPoint or anything, so I'm trying it today. But anyhow... And I, and I started putting this together last night, and I realized I'd worked on this once before, like five, ten years ago, and I actually found it. But, so what you have is you have the biggest long waves starting, and then it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Now, waves, they're measured in hertz. Don't want to get bogged down that, but how many waves per one second go by a given point? So, if there's five trillion waves going by here, which is approximately the color of yellow, we have five trillion waves going in one second going by. So they're very short, very fast. But then sound waves are very long and quite slow. So sound waves 
starting from zero waves a second, like there's nothing there, to one wave, and then it gets faster and faster and faster. So, so we're starting from sound wave down here, we move up, and then we get into radio waves. We have uh, FM waves first, they're, they're slow, but a little bit faster than that are, or AM waves first, a little bit faster than that are FM waves, a little faster than that are short waves, and then we start getting into the next thing that we encounter ourselves, that's the visual. Actually, there's one before that, infrared. You know what infrared is? That's heat. So we got these waves, we're starting out long and slow. We hear in this spectrum. Humans can only hear from about 20 waves a second to about 20,000 waves a second. That's it. So the lowest note we can hear is 20 waves per second. We hear those. Our eardrums, God designed those to be vibrated and to convert that into a you know, neurological signal that goes to our brain and we hear that as a very low note. Then we move up and we can hear higher and higher notes and finally we get about 20,000 waves a second. Sounds like a lot, but it's, they're quite slow compared to when we get way up to the top. 20,000 waves a second, that's where we can't hear anymore, they're too high. And, uh, and then that's it. That's our spectrum, 20 ways to 20,000 ways, that's what we hear. And within that, God has created us, given us these ears that allow us to hear pitch, high, low, loudness, softness, resonance, all different things. Our, God has designed these ears to pick up all these waveforms in the sound spectrum. So then we move on up, and the next thing we encounter is heat, about under 400, 30 trillion waves because it's just below the color red. So heat. Now, can we see heat? Do you see heat in here right now? No, but on a hot day and you see black pavement, what do you see? You are seeing those heat waves. They're shimmering. So we do catch a visual of that. But in the very next fastest waves, we get into red. And here's the way it went. We, we talk about ultra and an infra. Infrared means just below. So infrared means just below the color red. So we feel those. Can barely see them on a hot day. Then we get into the first thing we can see, which is color. The color spectrum. And red is the slowest of the waves, about 430 trillion waves a second. But we see that as red. And then, as they get faster and faster, we begin to see them as yellow. And then we get faster and faster from there, about 750 trillion waves a second. That is the color blue. And then when they get faster than that, whoop, out, don't see them anymore. So we've lost track. Now the reason I'm bringing this little science class up is because I've often pondered, you know, there's a text in the Bible, I think it's 1 Corinthians 2, and it can be taken two ways, this text. But, um, but it try, it, it, if we look at it from a perspective of what it's going to be like in the future, maybe say heaven, here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. As it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of a man the things which God hath prepared, prepared for them that love him. I hasn't seen. I can't. Imagination can't even comprehend because it's just... It's beyond our understanding visually, and it's beyond what we hear. It's beyond all these things. So here's the point. How much time do we spend contemplating heaven? We sing about it. Heaven is our home. Da 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 da. You know, we have songs about heaven. We talk about heaven's our reward. We're going to live eternally in this place called heaven. But what do we know about it? Well, the Bible does give us some details. If you go to Revelation 21, the whole chapter is about heaven. And we get into the fact that there's streets of gold. That's impressive. Uh, each gate, 12 gates on the New Jerusalem walls, is one pearl. And the size of the New Jerusalem is given in the Bible in furlongs, but you convert that to miles or whatever. You know what the size of the New Jerusalem is? 375 miles this way, 375 miles that way, 375, 375. And it's a cube, meaning 375 miles high. That's the size, the footprint is the size of the state of Washington, and actually bigger than the state of Washington, the footprint of the New Jerusalem. Okay, it's fun to listen to all this stuff, or, or hear about this stuff, and read about this stuff. 
But how do we comprehend something that's 375 miles tall? You know, you know how tall Mount Baker is? Two and a half miles. And I was working, I don't know how to put this, but I was working hard because I was going to go climb Mount Baker. This was about five, six years ago with a couple of friends of mine, firemen from Vancouver. They're going to take me up. We're going to climb Mount Baker. So I'm riding bike. I'm jogging. I'm doing everything to get in shape for this. Not even a big deal compared to Mount Everest or something. But for me, you know, I look out my window and see it every day and I figure I got to climb that one day. So I'm all ready. Everything's ready to go. Night before, got my backpack laid out, all my stuff laid out there, crampons, everything's just perfectly set up. And I'm going through everything in my head, what am I getting? And I forgot my headlamp, because we leave at two o'clock in the morning for the last thing. You know, it sounds like Everest, but it isn't. And so, so I, I go to run downstairs, because I knew where it was. It was in my drunk drawer. My wife calls it a junk drawer. Everybody has to have one of them in your dresser. So I go run down there, because I know, and as I'm running around, which, I, which I've lived in this house for decades, I run around the corner and I hook my little toe on the stairway and snap it off and it's 90 degrees from my foot. And I'm looking at that and I figure I'm not climbing Mount Baker tomorrow morning. Big disappointment. I run upstairs, do I get sympathy? No, she says, oh, you could hitchhike with that. <laughs> so I could hitchhike with my foot, yeah, because my toe's out 90 degrees. So I thought, how am I going to tell these guys they're all ready to go? So I just snapped a photo of it and text them. They said, what is that all about? I said, well, I'm not climbing tomorrow. Next week, I had to be in Switzerland, and, we're, and, and I had to do a bunch of filming with an, with an Italian translator, and we're up this incredibly beautiful valley up in, in, in southern Switzerland, in, in the Alps. And do you think I just want to wait around and not hike those places? So I'm, I'm grunting. You know, every day I'm out hiking on my heel, and I'm just, every step I'm going, mm, just glad nobody was there for half of it, but whatever. So the point is, is that's a complete rabbit chase of where I was going. Yeah, we're back to 375. Thank you for bringing me back. I look at her once in a while when I'm getting desperate as to how to get back to where I was. Anyways, 375. So Baker's two and a half miles high, New Jerusalem, 375 miles. You know how, you know, you know what elevation the, the space shuttle would travel at? 100 miles. So three and a half miles taller than that. So what I did one time, on my computer, I do a lot of this stuff because I got a wild imagination, I got to satisfy it. So I draw the circumference of the Earth on CAD, computer assisted drawing, because I'm an engineer. And then I put the New Jerusalem at 375 tall on top of this. Then I drew a line from the top of New Jerusalem down to where, where the horizon is on the Earth did a calculation, and if you had New Jerusalem here, you could see Toronto from here, from the top of New Jerusalem, after the curve. You can actually see Toronto. So I thought that was pretty cool. Anyways, so we have all those details. But the more I thought about heaven, all started by this smart mouth kid, uh, the more I thought about heaven, I thought, you know, it's interesting the way we look at heaven sometimes. You know what we do with heaven? We couch it in negatives. What do, what do I mean by that? Because we most often look at heaven in terms of what it isn't. Okay? What I mean by that? There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more tears. We won't have spiders and snakes or whatever other phobia you have. So we look at heaven in terms of what it isn't rather in terms of what it is. And that's what I want to try to get into today is what, look at it in terms of what it is. Because it's like going to Hawaii. You're getting ready to go to a trip for Hawaii, for example. You could say this. There won't be any snow blizzards there. Am I right? Of course I am. Or you could say it's going to be totally sunny and the beaches are pure white sand and whatever. So one way you look at it in terms of what it isn't, the other way you look at it in terms of what it is. Well, why don't we look at heaven more often in terms of what it is? Because our finite minds just can't quite grasp it. But if we take a little bit of science and add to the whole thing, we can begin to see a new perspective of what the new Jerusalem, what heaven is like. So, back to this. That was a little diversion. Back to this. So the slowest waves that we can, you know, encounter, that we can actually assimilate, are sound waves. Sound isn't very fast. The waves are slow. Uh, about 750 miles an hour, somewhere in there. So when a jet flies by over 750, breaks a sound barrier, you get a big boom. 
So 750 miles. And we know what that's all about because how many haven't uh, seen somebody hammering with a sledgehammer maybe two blocks away or maybe longer than that? They go, boom, boom. Sound comes later because it's slower. Light, on the other hand, visible light is 186,000 miles a second is how fast it travels. Well, we can't even begin to figure that out, really. So, point is this. We've got all these waves hitting us. Some we hear, some we feel, some we see. And as I was looking at all this, I thought, okay, so, so that's cool. But then this kid's question came back to me. What color lies above blue? And I thought, why can't we see beyond that? And then the thought hit me. <clears throat> when man sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned, they moved out into outer darkness. When they had to leave the Garden of Eden, there was something dismal about the place. And I believe that part of the curse of sin is we've lost the expanse of what God originally designed us for. So if you look at the electromagnetic wave spectrum on that wall, what we see the visible is just the tiny little strip from red, yellow, blue. So why? Why can't we see beyond that? So I started looking into this scientifically, and then what really ticked me off was this. I discovered that bees can see beyond what we can see. They can see in the UV, the ultraviolet, meaning above blue. Bees can see something we don't see. Now, how do they know that? Well, Thomas Eisner, a guy out of Cornell, was one of the leaders in this research. What he would do <clears throat> is they wanted to know why are bees attracted to one yellow flower versus another yellow flower? Is it the look? Is it the smell? Is it the whatever? So they isolated them. So they'd put a glass chamber over top of uh, a flower to try to isolate smell. And then they'd replicate, like daisies or whatever, they would cut them out of paper. And so there's one that looks perfectly the same as silk flower as the real one, but the bee would go to the real one. And by putting the glass jars over it so you get rid of the smell, they would still go to the real one. So what was the bee getting that we aren't getting? So they started photographing, because you can do this. You can make your film sensitive to other frequencies that we can't see or experience. So what they did is they took ultraviolet sensitive film and started filming flowers to see if there's something that they see that we don't see. And guess what? Don, if you can give us the next slide there. <clears throat> ultraviolet images. What we can't see, but many animals can. Bees see it. Uh, we, we have, uh, interestingly, reindeer see in the UV. How do they find lichen? You know, you got this big plane of it all looks the same. No, there's some UV reflection off lichen that leads reindeers to that. Also, they found, studying reindeer, is that, of course, the reindeer is always looking for urine of a predator. Not that they're interested in that, but it just tells there's something around. That reflects in the UV, they see that. So there's organisms that see in the UV that we don't. <clears throat> so let's, look at some, let, let's see what a bee sees that we don't. Well, there's your reindeer, there's your bee. Okay, move on. Now, this is what you see in visible light. This is what we see. That's what a bee sees in addition to the color. Isn't that interesting? They get to see something we don't. That's a ripoff. Okay, next one. There's another one. This is what we see. Bee can see that too. But the bee gets the added bonus of some geometric shapes within the petals. So paper versus a real flower, big deal to a bee. They're going to come to this one. Next one, we'll see what we got. We've got a few of them here. Yeah, here's some other ones. What normally see, here's what it's in UV film. Another one. Some more. Now, this is what gets me. Why would God, because aren't we as humans the pinnacle of God's creation? Yeah. But why would it be that God would create... <clears throat> us with the scientific mind to be able to make film that's UV sensitive to actually look and see what another organism gets, organism gets to see and we don't. I feel shortchanged. <laughs> because like Daniel said here, we, are, we were given, you know, we inherited the curse. We were narrowed down. Other organisms, by the mere fact that other organisms can see what we can't, 
lets us know that we've been shortchanged through the curse. Okay? So another one, Don, yeah, there's another photo of, of what a bee sees. We don't move the next one. Okay, some more, and now one more. Okay, okay, sunscreen, UV. They've taken pictures of people that put sunscreen on so you can see what happens in the UV. Okay, next. Another one in the UV. See, this is what we normally see. But if a bee, if he is interested in someone's face, he'd look at that and say, well, that's interesting. I'm going to go there and sting that person, possibly. I don't know that that's what they think. But anyways, okay, moving on. Now, okay, so that's above what we see. God has organisms that see something we, his pinnacle of creation, don't see. Short-changed. Now, below, below what we can see is heat, infrared. So all we see is we can start to see from red, yellow, blue. There's only three colors. You, add them, you, you mix them together and you wind up with all your other colors. What happens when you put uh, red and yellow together? What color do you get? Orange, yes, when you put blue and yellow together. Green, right. So all the combinations of colors. And here's all we're really seeing, just so we understand. This is all we're really seeing. When I look at the color red, what I'm seeing is all the red wavelengths in the 430, 450 trillion waves a second, they're all being reflected off whatever it is I'm looking at, and all the other colors are being absorbed. Okay, so if something's bright red, it's a reflection of the red wavelengths, but an absorption of yellows and blues. If I see a blue, blue is being reflected, and yellows and reds are being absorbed. And so on or on that topic, what color is black? Well, black really isn't a color, because you know what black is? It's the absorption of all those waveforms. That's why in a hot day, you put your hand on a, hot, on a black car, it burns your hand. Why? Because it's absorbing all the visual wavelengths into that paint. On the other hand, white is a reflection of all color. You know, normally we'd see color because it's reflection, but everything's being reflected, so it's just, it's just too much to assimilate, and it's just white. You put your hand on a white car on a hot day, and it's cool. Same as a roof. People put black roofs on in Palm Springs. Mm, probably not a smart idea. My dad went and put a pure white roof on his place down there, and it's amazing how much cooler it is because he's reflecting all this stuff back into the atmosphere. So while we're talking about those, add this little tip. Remember there was an advertisement, I think it was for caramel. How do they put the caramel in the caramel? And then I remember that ad, and then this little kid asks his dad a question. Dad, why is the sky blue? I didn't even know at that time, so I had to get on and study it up. You know why the sky is blue? Because as all these wavelengths of red, yellow, and blue are coming through the atmosphere, the shortest, littlest ones are blue. And as they're coming through the atmosphere, you know, believe it or not, there's moisture in the atmosphere, and way up to the small particles of dust and everything else. And so as those fine, all, the, the red waves are big. They just go right through it. The yellow waves right through it. The blue waves come down. They start to get scattered all over. They're being reflected off this moisture in the air. So we see the sky is blue. And blue is a nice color, no doubt about it. And so then sunsets. Why, why do we get red sunsets? Well, it's because you got the earth. At sunset, the, earth, the, the sun is coming down at a very shallow angle into the atmosphere. And what we have closest to the Earth's surface are the biggest molecules, like smoke particles, large dust particles and those. So as the sun is coming through on a shallow angle, it's going, it's going through more of those bigger particles in the air, and it starts to refract and reflect red. And that's why, you know, because I used to paint a lot, and, and I always, and I always have to stop and think, okay, if I'm doing a sunset, is it yellow on the bottom or red on the bottom? Whatever. Well, once I figured this all out, it's really easy. Because it's going to be red on the bottom because that's where the you know, biggest particles are in your atmosphere, like smoke particles and stuff. And the sun is going through there and reflecting down here. And then yellow next, and then blue up above that. Okay? So that's why the sky is blue. While we're here, might as well bring up another one. What color? No, I'll leave that one to the end. Hopefully I remember it. We're, we're still back on visual now. What we see, we only see from red to blue, right? And some animals see above us. We just discovered that. But here's what's another ripoff. 
There's a lot of animals that can see things below what we can see. Owls. Any nocturnal animal is seeing in the infrared. Meaning, uh, they don't need the same visual light we need to see because they're looking at heat radiation off things. They're looking at heat hitting things. So they have the ability to see clearly in the dark because they're not really looking at light waves anymore. They're looking at heat waves, infrared. So Don, if you can move, yeah, here, we got an owl. Let's, now what, is, what does that thing see? Something we can't see, move on. Terrible photograph, but that's filmed in the infrared. And they use infrared filming all the time. We had this case just recently here with Petita, or whatever her name is, and, and Laundry. You know, good and well, when they're running them swamps, they're using infrared sensing, looking for body heat. Because you can hide under a tree, but you can't hide your body heat from a sensor. And how, are they, how did they used to find, they don't care anymore, but how they used to find grow ops where they got lots of heat for the plants. They just fly over and they got infrared sensing equipment. They said, well, there's a house that's bright red. Too much heat coming off that thing. Doesn't look like their furnace. It looks like something else, so boom. Or they could just drive down the road and photograph in the infrared. Well, we get to see what an owl sees, or any nocturnal animal, we get to see. Here's a mouse in the infrared. Move on, Another, next slide. These are all done in pitch black, but infrared. Another slide. That dog, you know, pretty interesting. He's in the pitch black. Okay, another slide, but it's infrared. That, that uh, giraffe, at, that's at night. Next slide. This guy, nighttime. Next slide. These guys, infrared photography, night. This is pitch blackout. But infrared, any little heat anywhere is picked up. Okay, I think that's, is there another one? Yeah, another one, another one after that. Those are all done at night. So, why is it that God allowed some organisms to see in the infrared and not us? I feel like I'm shortchanged. And why would God make it so that we have an intelligent enough brain to make film that's infrared sensitive and film that's ultraviolet sensitive, and we can go out and look at things that we can't normally see? Why do we have to develop telescopes to see way out there or microscopes to see real tiny? God gave us the brain to do all this stuff. It's all interesting, but we're shortchanged because we have to create these things in order to see them. And then, what, like I said, what really bothers me is the fact that God's given some organisms the ability to see things we can't see. Now let's talk about sound. What did I say? The slowest way we can hear as humans? 20. 20 waves a second. The fastest we can hear is 20,000. That's what we hear. And then from there, we're oblivious. But interesting, dogs here at 45,000. We're 20,000 the highest we can hear. A dog can hear 45,000. A cat can hear 85,000 waves per second. They're hearing stuff that we're way beyond us. And then you get porpoises, 120,000 waves a second they can hear, and we can only hear 20,000. Why is it that God allows? I don't know what that sounds like. But well, my imagination says I'm missing out on something. And, and, and below us, 20, what's below us? Elephants. How is it that an elephant can communicate for 10 miles away? And we don't even hear what they're doing. But they have the ability to throw great, big, long, slow waves, and they can communicate each other miles away. And elephants can hear down to five waves a second. Hence, the big ears, to catch big waves like that. So here we are, we're shortchanged. God's given some organisms things we don't have. And there's a lot more. Um, so the point is this. If we take this little bit of science knowledge of these waves, and we assume that the reason we're limited is because of a curse. Our hearing has been scrunched. Our visual has been scrunched. Our ability to feel, we can feel a little bit of heat. That, we're okay with that. But it's been scrunched. And here's what's interesting to show, you know, God created skin, he created everything. Taste buds, I'm not getting any of that. I'm just talking about the electro electromagnetic wave spectrum today. 
But can you feel sound? They say that blind people can put their hand on a piano and actually determine pitch. But am I capable? Because a blind person, their, sen their, their senses of touch are enhanced because they've lost their ability to hear. So they've got the, their, their, you know, their senses have been increased. So, okay, so, but I've heard, I've felt sound lots of times. You pull up behind someone with two 12-inch subwoofers, and you just feel <laughs> And why do I like going to the symphony? Because they have, you know, really low instruments, especially the pipe organ. If you go to a good pipe organ, they have 32 foot, and some of them are 64 foot pipes. Well, the sound of those generator, womp, 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 you hear that low sound, barely, because some of it's just almost below what you can hear, and it hits you. You can close your eyes, you can feel the resonance of the strings coming at you in the cellos for sure, and you can hear, you know, the double basses and then that pipe organ when it hits those big pipes, woo, you can feel it. So somewhere along the line, God has given us that kind of sensitivity to hear sound, or, or sorry, to feel sound, but not much of it. But there are organisms out there that are highly sensitive, they're, they're feeling to sound. We don't have that. Okay, so now, if because of sin, we've been cursed, and that has limited, limited our scope of what we can sense through sight, through sound, through feeling. What will it be like when we're in heaven and that is reversed, that curse, and now it's all open? Now, you need an imagination to follow what I'm going to say next, otherwise you're going to think I'm a whack job. But the thing is this, Picture a choir in heaven, because I, I firmly, 100% believe that there's not going to be favoritism for animals over us. I believe that the spectrum is going to be wide open to every one of our senses. So, picture this, a choir of angels singing. I mean, their voices are going to be good, we know that. I mean, that's going to be amazing in itself, but that's nothing compared to what's going to happen. Say they're wearing white, wearing white robes with a purple sash. Okay, now follow me here. What is it going to be like to hear those angels sing and maybe it's more than four-part harmony, I don't know. It's going to be amazing just to hear that. So we're hearing, we can shut our eyes and we can hear that unbelievable vocalization coming at us. It's just some, beyond anything we've ever heard. That's going to be worth it in itself. But with wide open senses... What will the color of purple sound like? You heard me right. What would the color purple sound like? Because it's one thing to hear this beautiful voice is coming at you. It's another thing to see, the, to, to see the sound waves coming at you. My wife just did this, found this two days ago for me. And... Um, how they're photographing sound underwater. I haven't even looked at it yet, but she forwarded it to me. So, what will it be like to see sound waves? I don't know, but it's going to be amazing. To not only see the purple coming at you, because we get to see that, because the purple there is going to be far better, because our eyes are going to be restored. So you see the purple come at you, hear the purple coming at you, hear that all mixed in with the voices, audibly, but then our skin and our senses are going to be restored to such a state that we hear every single note, every voice hits our whole body. I know, it's a lot to grasp. You need to go home and spend the afternoon exercising your imagination. But that's exactly what it's going to be like. When everything's wide open again. So now when we look at a flower here, we see a beautiful red rose. That's amazing. But we're going to see what a bee sees now. In addition to the beautiful red, we're going to see a kaleidoscope of, of uh, geometric shapes emanating from that thing. And as we stand there and look at that rose, we hear the color. We feel the color, we feel the moisture off of it. You know what it's like a fresh rose? 
My wife gets them so all the time, so many roses all the time, it's not even special anymore, because she buys her own, sorry. But, <laughs> but you, know, you put your hand near a rose petal, you feel the moisture. Well, when you're 10 feet away and you can feel the moisture hitting you, you can feel the color coming at you, you can hear the color coming at you, you can see the color for sure, you can see the geometric shapes in the flower that bees see that we used to be able not be able to see. Wow, amazing. That's what heaven's going to be like. And then add to that, uh, what color is the sky going to be in heaven? Who cares? I know, though. I've done plenty of thinking about this and backing it up with science. What color is the sky here? Blue. What color is the sky going to be in heaven? Black. How do I know that? A couple of things. The Bible gives me a reference for that. Go to Revelation 20, 21. It's, it's in three different places in the Bible, but I want to I read this one here. Revelation 21, verse 23. It says this, And the city had no need of the, no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. If there's no need of a sun, and why would there be? Why do we have an atmosphere here? It's to protect us from the harmful rays of the sun. If we don't have a sun there, we don't need to be protected, so there's no need of an atmosphere. So what does that mean? All you have to do is look at space photos of spacecrafts out there taking pictures back of the Earth. Don, see if we got a few on here. I can't even remember. I didn't even get through this whole thing last night looking at it. MRR images, okay. Well, these are things that we can't see. For example, we take radio waves, convert them to sound, like an AM length wave, convert them to sound, send them out over, and our little radios in our cars or whatever, grab that AM wave that isn't sound and convert it back into sound. So we Take sound, we convert it to AM, send it out, receive the AM, convert it back to sound. That's what we do. MRI images, CAT scans, these different things are way up in the higher frequencies, like, like the X-ray and, and you know higher frequencies like that. Okay, so MR images, what can we see but imaging equipment can? So why would God allow us to look at you know the body or whatever through these things? And yet in heaven, I can't imagine God doing this, say, boy, if you want to see what your bones look like, or if you want to see what your tissue looks like, you remember back on Earth, you invented machines, you're able to do that. So I'll give you all the equipment here if you want to reinvent those machines and look at it again. No. That's going to be wide open to us. Okay, let's look at a few MRI images. Okay, that's what we see, and these are terrible photos because I just grabbed them off the internet. But. So that's in the radio frequency. Now move on a couple more. We can actually look inside a head using instrumentation in a higher frequency that we can sense at all. Okay, further, more. A tumor there, next. Now we're into x-ray. Way faster, what can we see? Next photo. Oh, get to see bones. It'll be pretty cool in heaven to be able to say, yeah, you got a crooked bone there. No, we won't, because we'll be restored to perfection. But anyways, okay, moving on. Okay, what color is the sky without an atmosphere? Blue, black, clear. Moving on. Oh, there we go. There's the black. Moving on. Black out there. Move the next one. Black out there. So, the sky in heaven is going to have to be black. There's no need of an atmosphere because there's no sun there. And here's what's really cool about that. If, there, if our light, and, and it says there's no night in heaven. Okay, that's right after this verse here. It talks about there's no night in heaven. Uh, verse 25. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Okay? So what does that tell me? Where is our light going to come from? Told us there. God's glory. If there's no night, at what point would we ever be without God's glory? Never. If there's no night and God is the, our light is God's glory, that means forever we are basked in God's glory. And no matter where we travel in the universe, and I know Don's going to be way out. He's going to be a space cadet when he gets to heaven, I know. He's going to be way out there somewhere. It will be light there. He will be in the presence of God. Isn't that awesome? And think of the scene of this new Jerusalem, this amazing, all the jewels. Just go home today and read Revelation 21, the whole chapter. All these amazingly beautiful, I mean, I can't imagine a monstrous gate, one pearl. That's just beyond my imagination. 
and, and Jasper and all the things that you read about this. But just think of this a little bit. Standing in the New Jerusalem on one of them streets of gold. Like how beautiful is gold when you have something gold, polished, nice gold, laying against blue. Pretty nice. But it really dazzles when it's against black. You know, you go to a jewelry store. I, I mean, I went once when we got engaged, but that was quite a few years ago. But I do remember they had black velvet and they put things on there. And, you know, just to make them pop. And so we're on the streets of heaven. It's gold. And above that, inky black skies. But it's bright. And now when we look up at, at the stars at night, it's like somebody took a paintbrush full of white paint on, on black tar paper, just one-dimensional. It's all we see. It's all these little white dots. No. It's going to be like a hologram, maybe a, a mobile, you know, those things where you hang things on it. We're going to see in 3D because God's going to restore our sight. And do we need telescopes? No. Do we need to send a telescope like the Hubble out of our atmosphere to get rid of all the clutter that's blocking our view? No, because we don't have the atmosphere that to deal with. It's just going to be crystal clear. Our eyes are restored to the level of Hubble is like somebody with bad eyesight. And not only that, but not just to see white spots out there and maybe a bit of color here and there, but to see it in 3D. You see the ones that are closest, closer, and the ones that are way out there at a further distance. I can't imagine what that's going to be like, standing on pure gold, so polished it just reflects this beautiful black sky, and here's in the middle of the day. Because see, when you're in space in the middle of the day, you can see everything out there. In the middle of the day now, because the atmosphere's got moisture and then the blue light is bouncing all over, it obliterates our view of the of all the stars in the heavens during the day. Well, no atmosphere, God's the glory. Wow, it's going to be just lit up in 3D anytime, anywhere, any, it's just going to be amazing. So when it says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, wow. Do we believe it? You take a bit of science, you add it to a lot that's given in the Bible, and you come out with a brand new perspective. And why do you think God gave us an imagination? Do you think imagination just kind of evolved? No, it was given to us. Because the best scientists out there started by imagining things, hypothesizing. God gave us imagination for a reason. He gave us all these beautiful little hints and clues in the Bible that all we have to do is just add a bit of science to them and all of a sudden they pop, they come alive. And we begin to see this place is going to be beyond anything we can comprehend. Our, and that's what Don and I were talking about this morning, our view of the universe, once we're restored, will be so far beyond anything we can comprehend because all we have now is all we can compare it to. Oh, I love red roses. Uh, they stink compared to what it's going to be like. The red roses here. Oh, heaven's going to be like? No, there's nothing to compare it with because we're looking at it from a limited view, a limited senses. And so we need to stop sometimes and just think how amazing it's going to be because if that's our reward, of course, there's more than that. I mean, we're going to spend eternity with Jesus. We'll never be able to comprehend what kind of love that is that would do that. So we got that big advantage. We have eternal life as a big advantage. But wow, what a place to live that. It's going to be utterly beyond comprehension unless we take a little bit of science. And I've just touched on a tiny little bit. We could talk about taste buds. We could talk about skin. We can talk about all sorts of things and compare that to what it's going to be like when we're restored. But God is so good. Sin has been so bad, you know, so limited us. But we just get content in our limitations and we think, oh, look at how beautiful nature is. It is. But ain't nothing. I know that's not good language, school teacher, wife, former school teacher. But that ain't nothing compared to what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. It'll be utterly, utterly 
amazing. And to know that we can travel to the very ends, if there is such a thing, of God's galaxies and have light there, knowing that our God's present is here with us wherever we go. Never be a night. We'll be on anything we can comprehend. And so on this earth, when we talk about heaven's my home, we don't have a clue what we're even talking about. Yeah, we try to pull together a little finite minds and, and try to imagine that it's going to be nice. No, we can't even begin. I hath not seen nor ear heard what it's going to be like when, you, when we finally get to heaven. Heaven's an awesome place. And you know what? What does it cost to take a trip there? You know what they're paying now? For what What they just pay for? Jeff Bezos had one, I think it was $24 million someone bid on and then gave it to some teenager, one of the flights, two flights ago. $24 million. Well, that's kind of a bit beyond my budget. Uh, but guess what? I'll be able to go way beyond just the edge of space. I'll go to the ends of space. And I'll be able to see way beyond your Hubble, your pathetic little Hubble and whatever else is out there, telescopes. It's just like, forget about it. Spend all your money here now because I get to go free. Free. And you know what it boils down to? A simple choice. Joshua said, choose you this day who you will serve. You know, what he, you know why he said that? Because he feared, why procrastinate? The upside of the decision is so huge, there should be no procrastination, no thinking about it. When you see what Jesus did for us, there should be no thinking about it. When you see what he's offering us, what we're just talking about today, there should be no thinking about it. There should be no, well, I'll wait tomorrow and ponder this a little bit more just to see if this is what I really want to do. No, get in the Bible. You'll find every reason to say yes today. Because heaven's worth it.